So um, I'd like to introduce now our next speaker, uh, Mark Enzer OBE. He's a strategic advisor at Mott McDonald. Um, many words here jumped out at me, so I'm going to I'm going to read them all. Um, systems thinking, digital transformation, connected digital twins, data infrastructure, low carbon sustainable solutions, circular economy. Lots of themes we've seen so far. Um, Mark's going to talk about digital twins. The future is connected. The ecosystems of connected digital twins. So, Mark, I'd like to invite you to the stage, but also just remind everyone this time: pop your questions in Slido. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to uh, talk about digital twins. It's nice to be given permission to do it, uh, to actually be allowed out and to, to be told, you can say digital twins without having to put money in the swear box, which quite often happens with, uh, with me and digital twins, I'm afraid. Um, so yes, what I would uh, like to do um, is talk about digital twins, but more particularly uh, to talk about connected digital twins. Uh, and the way I'd like to do it is to start off by just introducing what we mean by ecosystems of connected digital twins. Uh, so I'll take a bit of time to do that. Um, and then what I'd like to do is talk about what we've learned so far uh, on the journey that we have been on uh, on the National Digital Twin Programme. Uh, and um, what you'll find out when I talk about that is that most of it is not technical. Uh, I'm going to just do a little bit of a spoiler alert on that. Um, and then um, at the end, I'll just touch quite briefly uh, on what's happening now. Um, and another bit of a spoiler alert, uh, I think you're part of it. Um, so, digital twins. <clears throat> uh, what, I, what I won't do um, is give you a definition. Uh, I'm sure that if I asked uh, for hands, people have heard of digital twins before, everyone would put their hands up, uh, and most everyone will know that there's all sorts of definitions out there. Uh, I'm not going to give you another definition. Uh, I would say that uh, if you'd like a really good definition, uh, go to the AMRC. Uh, they've come up with something which really makes a lot of sense. What I'd like to do um, more is, is to describe the digital twin uh, and talk about some of the, uh, um, the components of it, uh, but also talk about the essence, the, the thing that makes it a digital twin. Uh, and I, I think it's represented on this diagram, really. Uh, a digital twin uh, has got these two things. It's got something physical going on, something digital going on, and there's a two-way connection. where You've got data going one way, from the physical into the digital, and you've got interventions going the other. That's it. It's a two-way connection between digital and physical. Uh, and, and I think that that's kind of essential. That's, that's really what digital twins are all about. But what I'd like to do um, is kind of take you through a little bit of a story to say that there's all sorts of different digital twins with all sorts of different use cases. So we can expect to see lots of different digital twins in lots of different shapes and sizes. And one rather silly little analogy, but it kind of works, uh, is, is thinking about mammals. Uh, because we all kind of know what mammals are, but they come in vastly different shapes and sizes, kind of depending on the environment that they're in. You know, there's a big difference between a shrew and an elephant or a duckbill platypus. And uh, it's the same with digital twins. So we shouldn't think just in kind of one dimension for digital twins. It really depends on the purpose of the digital twin. And then that defines everything else that you, you kind of need to know about that specific one. But let's imagine that there's lots of them in lots of different shapes and sizes. Um, and I would also say that I don't think digital twins are a technology. I think we should move away from that. I think it's much more an approach uh, and even more than that, maybe, it's a means of integrating technology. And there's all sorts of incredible, exciting technology that you can see being relevant around this cycle. Uh, so I won't be laborious about it, um, and I am very conscious uh, that on the first couple of clicks I do, uh, you will know loads more about these things than I do. Uh, so I'm just going to say, you know, this is, this is where you come in, and you know this stuff. Uh, so if we're going to get data from the physical world into the digital world, we kind of need some sensors. See what I mean? You, you know about this stuff. Um, and uh, it's amazing, the explosion in sensor technology and the reduction in unit costs of sensor technology. We can do this stuff. We can get data from the physical environment in all sorts of amazing and wonderful ways. Um, and then 
and it's not just sensors, is it? It's also observing. If we think kind of what satellites do, another source of data. Also, the Twitter fire hose, another source of data. But data can come from all sorts of different places. Sensors are important. And then to get the data from the physical world into the digital world, we've got IoT, we've got 5G, we've got all sorts of means of actually getting the data down that pipe. Uh, when the data hits the digital world, uh, we, we got to start doing something useful with it. You know, we got to start getting it into um, a, um, a state that is fit for use. Uh, and so we can see all sorts of advances in terms of data management platforms, really important. Uh, sometimes a bit boring, but really important. Um, and then also when you, you kind of come a little bit further around, and now what we're trying to do is make sense of the data. We've got the data, it's available, it's fit for use. We need to make sense of it. Um, and so uh, you, know, you can see where AI and ML do come in that, brilliant at spotting patterns, um, but there's, it's not just AI and ML, there's all the kind of modeling technology that we can use. You can imagine agent-based models and physics-based models and any other kind of model you can imagine, helping to make sense of the data, a key part of digital twins. Uh, and then we also need to have a look in to see what's going on inside the digital twin, because we're humans. And, and we, you know, we live in a cognitive world, we need that interface with the digital. And so to see inside it, we need AR and VR and MR. <clears throat> and it doesn't always have to be an immersive experience, but that's quite fun. Uh, what we almost always do need, though, is some way of having humans to interact with a digital twin. <clears throat> and then once we've done that, we can be making our better decisions. And I think that this is another one of those key things about digital twins. I think uh, the essence of what um, is the value of digital twins is something to do with making better decisions faster. That's where the value comes from. It, you know, whether we're talking about the shrew or the elephant, um, the, the key thing is making better decisions faster. So we've made those better decisions, and now we need to uh, um, kind of get back into the physical world. And so now we're thinking about um, the um, interventions. And the interventions can come in lots of different shapes and sizes too. You can imagine that some interventions might be fully automatic. Uh, in other cases, that would not be appropriate. You want a human in the loop. So an intervention is just as good to send out a crew to go and do something. That's an intervention. Uh, or you can use robotics. And notice that I'm surrounded by robots here. Um, and so what you see here is a vast array of incredibly exciting emerging technology, each of which is exciting on their own. I think they become even more exciting when they're integrated for a purpose, and that purpose is about making better decisions faster. We haven't finished the loop yet, though, have we? Because what we've done now, we've done an intervention on the physical side, uh, which probably changes the physical world in some way. You'd hope so, that's the point of the intervention. In which case, uh, we need to sense it again, don't we? And it goes back around the loop. Uh, and so, so this really is what digital twins are all about. Okay, so I've spent quite a bit of time on individual digital twins. Uh, what I'd like to do now is, is kind of zoom out a bit and, and say, if we've got lots of different digital twins, what can we have digital twins of? We can have digital twins of assets and processes and systems. The assets are the easiest one to imagine. Have a digital twin of a pump or a train, you know, helping us to understand and intervene more effectively in operational decisions. But also, you can have digital twins of processes. Now, that's really exciting, because that means you can potentially have digital twins of organizations, because organizations are, in some ways, collections of processes. Certainly well-organized organizations are. Um, but then it also means you can have digital twins of supply chains, digital twins of logistics. You see where I'm going with this? It's not, it's not a very physical thing, but you can definitely have a digital twin of it. Um, and you can also have digital twins of systems. So let's expand our minds and don't just think you can have a digital twin of, of just an asset. Uh, even though, I have to say, having a digital twin of an, an aero engine is super fun. I'm not, I'm not denigrating it, I'm just saying there's more. Um, I've already covered the thing about what, what gives the value, it's making better decisions faster. I've already kind of covered what happens inside a digital twin. I think there's three real components inside the, the twin bit of the, of the twin. It's the, the data handling, it's the modeling, and it's the, the visualization. You kind of need that stuff. Um, and um, what we've described here is a cyber physical system. It's a connection between uh, physical and digital. And Importantly, the whole thing should be driven by purpose. Uh, you don't start by saying, I want a digital twin, 
You know, what can I do with it? You know, can I buy a digital twin, please? Start with a purpose. You know, what decision is causing me problems? What decision can I make better? And therefore, what kind of di digital twin do I need? What data refresh rate do I need? Does it have to be real time? Or does it have to be right time? If you've got a digital twin of a glacier, you probably don't want a millisecond refresh rate um, on, on the movement of the glacier. Likewise, for the model, um, the fidelity of the model should be driven by the purpose. Likewise, for the interventions, the type of intervention and where the human sits in the loop depends on the purpose. Purpose is hugely important. OK, so now we completely understand digital twins, uh, and also we like the idea of having a digital twin of a train. I would like this because I've often been on a train and been told to get off it at Stevenage. It always seems to be Stevenage. Um, because one of the doors has broken. Why has one of the doors broken? We all have to get off. It's because we haven't noticed um, that actually uh, it was going to break. If you had an acoustic sensor on it and some kind of acoustic signature and you could tell it was going to break two weeks in advance of anyone actually hearing it. Okay, digital twin of a train. <clears throat> Let's put it in the corner for a moment. You can also therefore imagine a digital twin of the track. See what, what, how it's behaving in, in hot weather a digital twin of the signalling. Now, in the physical world, these things are obviously connected. Um, and what we mean by connected digital twins is that we also connect them in the digital world. And so, in the cyber-physical system that I've already described, inside the digital twin, you've got the two-way connection, and you've got a control loop. Um, this kind of connection I'm talking about is different. It's, it's an informed connection. It's a not, a, not a control connection. But it's really important because there's some information which will help you make a better decision for your, your bit, and it breaks the silos. OK, so now we've got what connected digital twins are. <clears throat> Let's look at the built environment because the scope of the National Digital Twin Programme was the built environment. And what we mean by that uh, is all the economic infrastructure, so that's energy, transport, water, waste, telecoms, um, which each one of those is a complex interconnected system. But they're connected to each other in an amazing complex interconnected kind of way. Uh, but that's not the whole story because you've got social infrastructure, hospitals, prisons, schools, commercial, industrial, residential buildings, none of which work unless they're served by that um, economic infrastructure. And then you've got the interface with the natural environment, <clears throat> um, which itself is complex and interconnected. So you add all of that together, and you get the built environment, this amazing, complex, um, adaptive, uh, and uh, emergent system um, that we've been building for a few hundred years. But quite often, we don't even notice the system because we live in it. Um, however, it matters um, because our society depends on it. Um, and so really, it would help if we understood the system better and we could intervene more effectively. I think this becomes even more important with the kind of challenges that we have just now, climate change, you know, assuming uh, or, or just looking at that for a moment, uh, there's no way that we can address net zero or achieving climate resilience or circular economy or biodiversity, uh, which are system level challenges. We can't solve those in silos. We need the systems thinking. In other words, we need to understand complex systems better. And this is where, potentially, connected digital twins can really help us. And where can they help us? Well, basically, in all of the processes, because the decisions that can be improved sit inside processes. And so you can have better use decisions, better operation decisions, better maintenance decisions. I won't keep going around the loop because you get the point. Um, wherever there are decisions, there are potential use cases. And, it's, and it, they should be connected, because I've drawn it there as an infinity loop that goes on forever, because it has to go on forever to support um, the systems, you know, which are like Trigger's broom. You know, he, how old is your broom, Trigger? It's 15 years old, but he's swapped the head five times and the, and the, uh, and the, uh, the handle six. Um, it's the same with the system. It has to go on forever. Uh, and so we can um, improve those decisions, make better decisions faster, improve the whole thing. OK, so what that means is that we can see use cases wherever we look. Um, and if we start then to draw what that looks like across that whole ecosystem, um, you can see how there's a connection then between the digital worlds and the physical worlds. And we've heard a lot, haven't we, about the metaverse recently. It's kind of a place where people might go to play. Um, but this is really starting to talk about the engineering end of the metaverse. You know, it's, if you look at the, the metaverse as the sum of all digital worlds, we are creating digital worlds here, but we're connecting them up with a purpose. Uh, and this connection... Um, you can start to see happening all over the place. 
um, but then the connection between the connections. And so we have this ecosystem of connected digital twins. Um, that might sound like it's impossible, uh, but it really isn't, because these connections I'm talking about actually just come down to data sharing. Under the hood, that's all it is. It's about information flow across organizational and sector boundaries, and we can do that. Um, it's just that we have to do it in a consistent way. So the three things which we need to make this work, we need to have uh, consistent high quality data models so that digital twins can talk to each other, otherwise you always have to put translation in. You need to have shared reference data and we need to have common access and security protocols so that only the right people get access to the right data. And that's it. We, we should do this, shouldn't we? Because this is, it's not just fun, this is kind of important. Um, so what have we learned so far? And I, I'm gonna be brief on this. Um, uh, even though I would like not to be brief, um, because these are really important lessons. Um, we need to be, all of those things, I'll, I'll run through them quickly. First one, outcome focused. I already talked about the purpose of individual digital twins. I think we need to see a bigger purpose for the big thing. What's the purpose of the built environment? And that purpose really needs to be about enabling people and nature to thrive together for generations. And if we see that purpose, then we can start to use the system towards that purpose rather than it just being a blob that happens to be there. You know, we can be more purposeful about it. Um, and with it being purpose-driven, we can do very purpose-driven things. Uh, we, we did something called Credo, the Climate Resilience Demonstrator, which demonstrated that you can actually make better resilience decisions uh, if you're a water company having access to information about the energy assets and the telecoms assets on which your water assets depend. It kind of stands to reason, doesn't it? But we had to prove it. Um, it should be systems-based. Start with the outcome. Start with what we want. Uh, and see how built and natural systems can be used to, to get there, uh, recognizing all those uh, lovely use cases for every decision in every process. Uh, I'm not, by the way, suggesting that we'll end up with digital twins for everyone. It should be business case driven. Um, we should recognize that this whole thing um, has to be more than technical. The technical stuff is super fun uh, and really challenging. It's totally doable, uh, but it, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. What we absolutely found was this, this whole thing um, is a socio-technical challenge, uh, and actually the, the human and the organizational factors are much harder than the technical ones. You know, this is addressing things like um, capabilities and um, ethics and legal solutions, regulatory solutions, commercial solutions. You know, those aren't technical, but if we don't sort them out, then this whole thing doesn't work. It's a socio-technical program. In fact, we think it's a socio-technical change program because we have to move from where we are to where we want to get to. It's a change. And so we need to manage it as a change. We need to understand theory of change. We need to understand how interventions lead to an improvement in performance, how the performance relates to the outcomes that we want. And so actually what this means is that we need to make friends with some social scientists um, because it's, uh, you know, we, can't, we can't do this just as, um, as roboticists. Um, it should be values guided because something as powerful as what I've just been talking about can be used for good and it can be used for ill. And so it needs to be driven from the beginning with values in mind. We developed this thing called the Gemini Principles. I'd love to go into it in more detail, but you see key to it are three words, purpose, trust, and function. Probably the trust is the most important one because if people don't trust this kind of thing, then it's absolutely useless. So how do you get trust? It's some kind of function of security and openness and quality. Like I say, I'd love to talk more about it. Also, this is a community-based thing. We can't do it. We can't have you know, some clever people doing it in a, in a cupboard and then coming out and saying, da-da, here's the answer. Yeah, we've got to do this together, uh, which is where we all come in. The Digital Twin Hub was established to bring the community of people who care about this stuff to work together on it. Um, and being community-enabled, we need to understand how the top-downness and the bottom-upness of it. We think it's both. Uh, we kind of had this uh, silly little um, mantra about um, collaborating on the rules and competing on the game. Competition works really well, but you know, football is no fun if there's no rules. You've got to agree the rules first, and then you can have amazing competition. Uh, and so I think we need to come together to agree the rules. The key rules in this case are how do digital twins talk to each other. If you can get that sorted out, then you've got an amazing playing field to go and play the game. So this is what we learned. Outcomes focused, purpose driven, systems based, values guided, socio technical, community enabled, and I bet you want a Pepsi now. <laughs> um, 
What's happening now, and I'm going to be very, very brief on this because of, because of time, but um, all of this whole thing got kicked off by something called Data for Public Good, came out from the National Infrastructure Commission. That has guided us in an incredible way. You can see the public good purpose is, is right there from the beginning. Uh, but this is also supported by other um, kind of national policy um, uh, around the transforming infrastructure performance, national infrastructure strategy, national data strategy, um, also the um, strategic review. The, sorry, the integrated review. Um, what it needs, though, it needs to be convened and coordinated. Uh, what we see is that there's some absolutely brilliant stuff going on in all of these three key domains around industry and government academia. But it does have to come together. You know, what we need here is a distributed, connected model, not a fragmented model. So there's some work, I think, to do on that. But um, there's amazing work in every single one of these domains. And then finally, and this is, this is kind of like my warning thing, um, I, I hope you've got a sense that this could be incredibly powerful you, in, the, in the macro scale, uh, or micro scale, which every, every scale we want to look at. Um, but it could go wrong. It could go badly wrong, and it might not happen. And I think there's two really key market failures. And the first one for me is, is a failure to federate. If we don't federate, then this thing doesn't happen. We can have lots of individual lovely digital twins doing really clever stuff, but if we don't federate, then we don't get the real benefit. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a worry. And the other one, I would say, is a potential ethical failure. Uh, you, we, we need to be pretty, pretty absolutely firm that um, this needs to be driven by ethics and founded on ethics in just the same way um, that on the technical side, it needs to be founded on security. So I'd leave you, leave you with that, but kind of say, um, you, 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 with what you do, and you saw where you fit into my little diagram, um, are part of this story. So thank you. So we do have time for a couple of questions, so um, we're going to plow on with those. This one also from Anonymous, I'm not sure if it's the same Anonymous. Um, can you comment on the use of digital twins in safety critical systems? Yeah, um, I, I, I don't know where Anne, Anne Anonymous is sitting, um, <laughs> but um, you can imagine how um, potentially valuable um, digital twins are in safety critical systems and how some of the key decisions that could be made better are safety decisions, um, you know, being delivered the right information at the right time in the right form to the right people um, is critical to safety. And so I, I think that's probably the main thing I would want to say on that is, is just this is a field which is ripe for digital twins to, to bring benefit. Yeah, brilliant, thank you. Um, this is also from Anonymous, um, maybe a different one. Um, what industry has embraced digital twins the most, and what industry slash sector should be using digital twins but isn't? Oh, that's a lovely question. <clears throat> so um, what I talked about was in the context of the built environment because that's what our, our scope was. But very early on, we found out, well, we, it was obvious, <clears throat> that exactly the same stuff is really relevant um, ac across the sectors. Uh, and so uh, in our program, we learned an awful lot from advanced manufacturing and aerospace. I would say that probably aerospace is the, is the most advanced that, that we, we can see. But interestingly, they're more advanced in individual digital twins. The stuff that I was talking about, making digital twins talk to each other, is, is less so. Um, there's also, um, uh, you can imagine, really... Um, important and relevant applications of digital twins in defense. Um, whoever has the best digital twins wins, is, um, is what I would say there. Um, and then um, also in healthcare, um, some really good advances in digital twins. But the one which I think is, is relevant potentially for the, the next talk um, is food and farming. You can easily imagine digital twins of farms, but also digital twins of logistics, digital twins of everything to do with the whole um, farm to fork view of, of food. So connected digital twins is, I would say, can potentially add um, a huge amount of value in that specific space. Super, thank you. So I'm gonna squeeze in one last question. Which types of parameters are most difficult to transfer to the digital environment? Hmm. That stumped me. Uh, I, I don't know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to go straight for that. Um, it's a good question. Um, 
as you can tell, because I haven't got uh, an answer. Uh, so I'm going to go and think about that. Excellent. Well, we will let you think about that <laughs> and just say a, a huge thank you to you um, for taking the time um, to share your, um, your message with us. Um, I love the, 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 the juxtaposition. People are just the heart of technology. Don't ever let people tell you that they're not. So um, thank you again very much to, to Mark. Mm -hmm.